Welcome. My name is Joshua, and that is one of John MacArthur's three sprawling homes. You heard that right. Three. And I'm willing to bet you don't have a tennis court on yours. Mr. Anti-Prosperity himself appears to be living the lavish millionaire lifestyle of your run-of-the-mill prosperity preacher and, to a degree, even more opulent than some of the worst. Indeed, if you do a little bit of cursory research, John MacArthur's net worth uh, far exceeds some notable names. Some estimates are hovering right around the $14 million mark, which for many people is not a surprise. It's not a surprise. And in a recent uh, article, a well-researched and excellent article, I'll add, by Julie Roy's, Entitled, The Prosperous Lifestyle of America's Anti-Prosperity Gospel Preacher is laid out in exquisite detail the shameful opulence, corruption, kickbacks, nepotism, etc. behind John MacArthur, Grace Community Church, the Master's University and Seminary, and all related branches of his empire. There is a lot to cover here, and uh, primarily we're going to be going through Julie's article, but I want to start with some scripture. We will orient ourselves with God's Word, the only rule of faith and practice, in uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Jesus speaking, uh, beginning in verse 13, says this, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or money. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Well, well, what is highly esteemed among men? Empires, book deals, massive auditoriums, tennis courts perhaps, um... a prefix of doctor, a study Bible with your name stamped on it. There are many things that are esteemed among men which God has no interest in, or if he does have an interest in it, it's not a good one, which God would find abominable. Well, John MacArthur is certainly esteemed among men, has been for many years. And for a lot of people, none of this is shocking. This isn't a surprise. It's merely confirmation of what was already uh, known um, or suspected with good reason. Um, That is, when their uh, documents aren't forthcoming, um, yet you realize that this multi-million dollar uh, empire and the networking behind it, uh, something is amiss. that you can't quite put your finger on because you don't have the hard evidence. Uh, but some of that has come out over the years. I've mentioned this, uh, I forget in, in which video, but um, uh, MacArthur's $400,000 plus dollar a year salary. Um, already, you should have questions, big questions. Um, the objections immediately begin coming. Ah, well, John MacArthur didn't make his money like the health and wealth and prosperity people by lying to them or conning them into, you know, some outrageous doctrine. John MacArthur just happened to get rich by saying different things. But he said true things, and that makes it better. Well, I will concede that John MacArthur has said many true things. Uh, I will go further and say that compared to... uh, Kenneth Copeland, for example, um, John MacArthur stands in stark contrast 
at least on paper, at least in word, uh, to the things that Kenneth Copeland espouses. Um, but even doctrinally speaking, there are many people who shockingly took no issue with John MacArthur saying you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. This is not a light issue. This is ridiculous, and it is as damnable as anything Kenneth Copeland preaches. So, and those are things I've dealt with. Those are things other people have dealt with. Um, MacArthur's gross hypocrisy, double standards and partnerships, uh, hiring Matt Redman, a uh, Catholic sympathizer, to come lead worship for them, uh, being buddies with uh, Jack Graham, who is part of the Hillsong Network, uh, and, a, and a collaborator with them, and so forth. John MacArthur has been a proven hypocrite for a long time, but there's something about financial impropriety that even the world loathes. And we set this false dichotomy up in our minds, that because John MacArthur is not Benny Hinn, or because he is not Kenneth Copeland, uh, that therefore this is a radically different scenario. As if to say that the speaking of truth and covetousness were mutually exclusive. They are not. They are not. We see examples of this in the Bible, and we are told this explicitly in the Bible. This is how easy and subtle deception is. The Bible makes it very clear. Uh, Paul speaking to Timothy, I think it's in 1 Timothy 6, uh, that there are those who think that Godliness and righteousness is a means of gain. Godliness is a means of gain. He says in Philippians chapter 1 that there are some who preach Christ. True enough, they preach the same Jesus, but they do it from a place of envy and strife, self-ambition. They say the right things with the wrong motives. And you don't always know what those motives are. But then you see a person like Judas Iscariot. Question. Can anybody point to a false doctrine that Judas taught publicly? You cannot. Was Judas not among the twelve that Jesus gave power over? Power over demons and uh, to, to heal diseases? And sent out to preach the gospel? Was Judas not among the rest of the disciples? Yes, he was. There is not a single instance of Judas preaching false doctrine. And this is further confirmed at the Last Supper when Jesus says, Somebody here will betray me. And not one person in that room stood up and said, It's Judas the one who teaches false things all the time. Nobody said that. Judas seemed to be so not on the radar that everybody began accusing themselves, saying, is it I? Am I, am I the one? Because Judas wasn't, there, there were no red flags coming out of the back of Judas, apparently. Hindsight is twenty twenty, so we read later that Judas was a thief. So that when he indicated that this costly oil should have been sold for such and such uh, t t and given to the poor, they said he didn't say this because he was really concerned about the poor, but because he's a thief. He was a thief, and he wanted the money. But these weren't things that were immediately apparent. They were apparent only later. So, you can say the right things for the wrong reasons. Eventually, it's flushed out. So the notion that covetousness and the speaking or preaching or proclaiming of truth are mutually exclusive is biblically absurd, but watch the MacArthurites attempt to use that argument. They will. Let's get into it. Uh, I will commend you to reading the entire article that Julie Roy's authored. Actually, two of them that we're going to go over. Uh, because once she exposed this, they resorted to some sneaky, underhanded, pharisaical, and potentially illegal tactics. John MacArthur's 
friend, co-elder, and right-hand man, Phil Johnson, ended up doxing Julie Royce. We'll get into that. So read the entire article. We won't read it all, but we're going to read a fair amount of it. And it begins... For decades, John MacArthur has railed on prosperity preachers, likening them to greed mongers who led first century cults. Recently, he's also taken aim at the scandal plagued evangelical leaders like the late apologist Ravi Zacharias and former Hillsong pastor Carl Lentz, okay? saying these celebrities were in ministry only for the money. That's why liars and frauds. And false teachers are in business, MacArthur said in a recent sermon. False teachers always do it for the same reason. Filthy lucre, money. Now remember, remember the Bible says what? You will know them by their fruits. When the fruit of a ministry is nepotism, corruption, covetousness, kickbacks, and potential illegality, which we're going to get into, You will know them by their fruits. Behold the fruit of John MacArthur. Yet according to a financial statement and uh, financial statements and tax forms obtained by the Roy's report, John MacArthur and his family preside over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets and generates more than $70 million a year in tax-free revenue. Again, most people aren't surprised, but when you see the numbers in black and white, well, that's kind of shocking. But listen, MacArthur and his family and related companies have been paid more than $12.8 million from ministry and donor funds, and MacArthur owns three luxury homes worth millions. In one year alone, MacArthur made more than $402,000 for part-time, part-time work at his broadcast ministry, Grace to You, and another $103,000 from the Master's University and Seminary. This was in addition, in addition to his salary from the megachurch he pastors, Grace Community Church, as well as book royalties and speaking fees. (sighs) What a tangled web we weave. MacArthur's Millions and Homes. Now, before we get into this too deeply, uh, we're going to get a brief word of commentary from one of MacArthur's staunchest apologists, defenders, advocates, and general yes-men, Justin Peters, uh, who has had no small qualm with the word of faith and prosperity preachers, Again, which I agree with him about. To the extent that MacArthur has critiqued these individuals, I agree with him as well. But bear in mind, two people may sell completely different products, but it doesn't mean they're not in sales. Nicorette gum is in competition with Marlboro cigarettes. It's a completely different product. Its aim is to cancel this one out to take business from this one. But they're still a business. They're still a company. They're still in sales. And not unlike the politicians in Washington, which perhaps now more than ever, people are seeing a bit more clearly, talk is cheap. George W. Bush said a lot of different things than... Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, for example. Yet, if you look at the trajectory of their lives and their actions, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the difference. They are good at saying different things, and at the end of the day, they do the same things. They end up supporting the same things. They have the same friends, the same networks, and truthfully, the same ideologies despite their hollow words to the public. So, you might have rightly sympathized with some of the words of George W. Bush or Donald Trump or pick a person. You might have sympathized more with their words, but the Republican Party, as you know it, is as corrupt as the Democratic Party. 
on a whole. Of course, there are exceptions to everything, but on a whole, that label means nothing. And people have spent years in Washington issuing empty promises, saying the right things and doing the opposite of what they said. So mere speech is no indication of integrity. Justin Peters, though, he has benefited handsomely from John MacArthur's ministry. Uh, By that I mean uh, John MacArthur has given him quite a platform. Justin Peters was welcomed into the good old boys club, so to speak. And Justin Peters will defend that with everything he has, because Justin Peters loves the applause of men. Now, he will appear to have a a deep-seated annoyance and even a heartfelt uh, disturbance toward false teachers. But when he remains silent in the face of his his mentor, uh, John MacArthur's, I don't know, approximate $14 million net worth, multiple millions in assets and so forth, you're looking at a hypocrite. Watch the last video if you didn't see it. But let's get a let's get a, a dose from Justin Peters here. Listen carefully. We have to be careful in ascribing motives, but it's hard to ignore the obvious. There's a lot of money to be made in going to heaven. Oh. These books have sold multiple, multiple millions of copies, and, and these numbers are even old now. They're far bigger than what these numbers are. Let's just okay. say they get a dollar off each book. Let's, Let's say, say they get 50 cents. 50 cents. A lot of money to be made and go into heaven. And that doesn't even count the movies, what they got off the movies. That doesn't count what they make off of their careers and going from church to church to church deceiving people. Okay. A lot of money to be made and go into heaven. So he's talking about people that write books about going to heaven, like Heaven is for Real, authored by Todd Burpo, father of four-year-old at the time, Colton Burpo. He's right. There's a lot of money to be made in going to heaven or uh, in a book deal in general. Sure, there's a lot of money to be made. And John MacArthur's made a lot of money. There's also a lot of money to be made saying the opposite thing. There's a lot of money to be made selling Nicorette gum, just as there is selling a pack of cigarettes. Two completely different products, products in competition with each other. There's a lot of money to be made selling junk food, and there's also a lot of money to be made selling Jenny Craig memberships. Two completely different products seemingly canceling each other out, but it doesn't mean the motive isn't identical. Business. There's a market for it. And while you can't always discern the motives, sometimes you can. Like he said, it's hard to ignore the obvious motive here. There's a lot of money to be made selling these books. Well, speaking of books, this is a view of gracebooks.com. This is John MacArthur's related uh, website. These are books by John MacArthur. Okay. There are five pages here. I believe I counted 78 books. 78 books authored by John MacArthur. Indeed, there is a lot of money to be made. Should we not ignore the obvious motive here? 78 books? To my knowledge, Todd Burpo has at best authored three books. And they're really all related. It's a far cry from 78 books. Now, no doubt the content is different. But when you examine the luxurious millionaire lifestyle of John MacArthur, you're going to start to see a very similar motive. So there's a lot of money to be made in selling books about heaven. And there's a lot of money to be made selling books about other things. 78 books from John MacArthur. Indeed, he is a wealthy man. But let's continue with Justin. This is Jesse Duplantis' parsonage is parsonage. I took this picture. That's my mirror there in the corner. Justin went there. He went there to find Jesse Duplantis' house just to take a picture. So we know that Justin's okay with this. 
35,000 square foot parsonage. Okay. Got to live in something, I guess. Got to live in something. A lot of money to be made going to heaven nowadays. Yeah, well, I don't know. Does Jesse Duplantis' parsonage have a tennis court? Because John MacArthur's home does. One of his three homes. Just this one. This is just the one in Santa Clarita. Hmm. What does Justin Peters have to say about John MacArthur's three-home lifestyle? Because it stands to reason, while I haven't confirmed this uh, uh, in, in documents, that parsonage is very likely owned by the the Jesse Duplantis's church there. It's probably in their name, not his personally. These are John MacArthur's private homes. Now, it's pretty obvious Jesse Duplantis is a greedy devil. I, I don't take issue with that whatsoever. But Justin Peters sought his home out just to take a picture of it, just to show you his opulent life. Now, what will Justin Peters say about John MacArthur's rich and prosperous life? So let's get into his millions and homes. Um, down here... Uh, Julie uh, Royce uh, continues, while it is true that John MacArthur has lived in the same Santa Clarita uh, home, in his home in Santa Clarita, California, since the 1980s, the property is worth $1.5 million, which is more than twice the median value of homes in the area. The five-bedroom, four-bath house sits on more than two acres and includes a tennis court and a swimming pool. The home is also not John MacArthur's only residence. No, John MacArthur needs three houses to fill his appetite. Since 1996, MacArthur has also owned a $700,000 villa about an hour west of Santa Clarita, according to a document the Roy's report obtained from the Ventura County Tax Assessor's Office. Now, of course, you can uh, open this and uh, read it for yourself. She has uh, this document linked. It is taking a while to load. We'll come back to that. Uh, well, let's give it a second. There you go. So John and Patricia MacArthur are listed here. Uh, by all means, go back and sift through this. The three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath home is located next to a world-class private club with a championship golf course, tennis courts, pool, and fine dining. The home is also just 11 miles from the beach. MacArthur's third and largest home is a seven-bedroom, seven-and-a-half bath ranch on five acres in Colorado Springs. It was built in 2007, according to El Paso County records. The property was given to Circle M Ranch, a limited liability limited partnership owned by John and Patricia MacArthur by David Wismer Sr., uh, Wismer is a longtime member of the Masters University and Seminary Board of Directors. Oh, that's shocking. And also served as the Masters University and Semin Seminary Board Secretary. I spoke with Wismer, and he told me that in 2007, MacArthur approached him, expressing that he wanted to build a home in Colorado Springs. Wismer said he owns a 2,600-acre ranch in Colorado Springs and was happy to give five acres to MacArthur as a gift. Well, I'm sure it didn't hurt that he was also on the Masters University Board of Directors. I wonder what he was regifted. I don't know. Anything? Wismer said that MacArthur then built a home valued at around $800,000 on the Colorado property using his own funds, and boy, does he have a lot of them. So you can see here, it looks like he's got his own lake on the property. Um there's MacArthur's Ranch, his third and largest home. From 2005 to 2015, MacArthur made about $3.4 million in compensation from Grace to You and the Master's Seminary for an average of about $320,000 per year. On top of that, MacArthur also took a salary from Grace Community Church that was well within the upper medium range for California church employees, according to Phil Johnson's 2014 statement. This puts MacArthur's annual combined salary at an estimated half million dollars most years. And in 2012, when he was paid an especially high salary, 
and benefits from Grace to You, MacArthur's salary likely pushed three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, there's another perspective here uh, from a, a gentleman named uh, Brent Detweiler. Hopefully I'm, I'm saying that right. Uh, formerly involved with Sovereign Grace uh, Ministries, uh, C.J. Mahaney and some of those people whom John MacArthur was a conference partner of. And uh, after their uh, child sex abuse scandal, never uttered a word. Uh, in any event, there's more to it than that. But uh, he has a unique assessment here uh, as somebody who was a secretary for them or a treasurer, I believe. He says, I estimate John MacArthur makes one and a half to two million dollars a year. He has paid three salaries from Grace Community Church, Grace to You Media Ministry, and the Master's University and Seminary. That doesn't include his ministerial housing allowances, which goes unreported on tax forms or IRS reporting forms. Nor does it include his income from book royalties, honoraria, and bonuses. 200 books have been written under MacArthur's name. I only found 78 for sale on their website. There's apparently quite a bit more. 200 books written under MacArthur's name. That amounts to hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties every year. How much does he receive? He speaks at the biggest conferences in the nation. They pay thousands of dollars in honorarium for featured speakers. And what bonuses and gifts does he receive? For example, what did he get last year on the 50th anniversary of his pastorate? We'll come back to this article in just a moment. The point is, uh, on a low end, John MacArthur's making 320000 and uh, potentially close to $2 million per year, all told. Not exactly humble living from anti-prosperity, Mr. John MacArthur. In Johnson's 2014 statement, he explained that MacArthur's salary and benefits topped 400000 in the fiscal year ending in 2012 because the Grace to You board gave John MacArthur a rare first edition King James Bible that year. The Bible, Johnson said, was a one-time gift capping 40 years of faithful ministry. I haven't evaluated, I don't know what the market's like for first edition King James Bibles, but they're pretty expensive. And so they just casually gave him a first edition. It's it's almost comical. It's so ridiculous. A first edition King James Bible. And uh, those of you who donated money to that ministry, there it is. Just just casually buying John MacArthur items that are typically found in a museum. First edition King James Bible. It's just amazing. In addition, and they and they do it straight-faced. There's no shame. It is utterly shameless. They don't have to have shame because they have power. And they don't have accountability. And you'll see why they don't have accountability in just a moment. Right? The power rests with the people that give them money. As you're going to see, this, this money is what they work for. It's obvious. Like Justin Peters said, we can't ignore the pretty obvious motive that there's just a lot of money to be made in this industry. Make no mistake about it. The evangelical um, uh, industrial complex, as many have termed it, including Julie Roy's, uh, is is a massive money-making endeavor for many people. And again, Paul says, some people preach the truth from a place of envy and strife for reasons of selfish ambition and so forth. So, the preaching of truth and covetousness are not mutually exclusive. You must understand that. And by the end of this, hopefully you will. In addition, Johnson stated that Grace to You paid John MacArthur zero salary or benefits for the first 30-plus years of our ministry's existence, which apparently turned out to be a lie because uh, they found 990s, uh, IRS forms, um from 2002, showing that MacArthur made $88,000 that year, and that was only 16 years after Grace to You was founded, not 30 years after. Uh, Phil Johnson has a habit of uh, of lying, so uh, the man does not appear to have a, a conscience whatsoever, so 
he says things like this. He'll say, he, he, he can say whatever he wants. He edits MacArthur's books, and he wields a lot of power in the Grace community circuit. Um, not to mention, he probably has a say in who's invited to the Shepherds Conference and things like this. So Phil Johnson gets away with a lot. Hopefully not for long, though. Phil Johnson might have committed a crime. Maybe. That's what we're trying to figure out here. It's possible. Uh, Okay, so she goes on talking about uh, Phil Johnson here. Um, Yet the hours MacArthur claimed to work each year seemed to bear little relation to the salary he received. For example, in 2007, MacArthur claimed to work 20 hours per week at Grace to You and received 174000 roughly, dollars. In 2008, he reportedly worked 10 hours per week and received nearly as much, 177000 uh, So they show how his salary varied. Um, uh, it says here, though it's not documented below, Phil Johnson received between 160000 and $238,927 per year between 2005 and 2015 for his role at Grace to You. That's just the media ministry. That's not the church. They are separate entities. Keep this in mind. The Master's Seminary and University or University and Seminary, Grace Community Church, and Grace to You, they're all related, but they're separate individual entities. They have their separate streams of income, and they pay out salaries separately. This is just how much Phil Johnson received from being the executive director of Grace to You. But remember, he's also an elder uh, at Grace Community Church, for which it stands to reason he is also compensated. Here it says he also received a no-interest loan of $50,000 from the ministry for the purchase of a home which was fully forgiven over a five-year period. Anybody surprised? Anybody surprised at the the cronyism going on here? Here's a man who makes an exorbitant salary already. And they casually kick him $50,000 interest-free loan, which was fully forgiven over a five-year period. A man who's already wealthy. A man who very likely has a net worth in the millions of dollars. Very likely, according to these uh, figures about how much he receives uh, each year. And he gets a $50,000 interest-free loan uh, f- that was fully forgiven. I wonder if there were, I don't know, 10 families at Grace Community Church who were living below the poverty line that could have used 5000 each. I-, I wonder. I'm just curious. It will never happen. They take care of their own. That's why you hear funny little phrases like, we're here for you. There's always a contrast between the inner circle, the employees at a megachurch, and you, the audience member slash fundraiser for the church. They don't see it as a collective family. It is us and you, we and them. If you need anything, you let us know. We're here for you. That's not how families speak. It's how businesses speak. John MacArthur is a businessman first and foremost. But what about $50,000 loans uh, to employees? Well, let's go back to that article by uh, Brent Detweiler. Now, he's very candid about his time with Sovereign Grace Ministries, and he says, let me illustrate. Here was my total income back in 2007. I was a very blessed man. That's one way to put it, but I appreciate his candor. $67,750 wage, $49,000 housing allowance, $14,550 honoraria, $8,000 in bonuses for a grand total of $139,000 thereabout. Men in ministry who are grossly overcompensated, like MacArthur, hide their many sources of income and total compensation package. The In the illustration above, if asked how much I made, I could say $67,750, since that is the amount reported as my wage on W-2 forms, on my W-2 form, but that would be terribly misleading. Honesty would double that amount. 
And that doesn't include other benefits like a pension plan, a retirement account, health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, transportation, home maintenance, and money allowances for study, retreats, sabbaticals, and education. Listen. Or an interest-free loan of $50,000 that was written off to MacArthur's right-hand man, Phil Johnson, to buy a home. That is corrupt. It is also illegal, says Brent. It's called private inurement under IRS regulations. John MacArthur's never going to reveal all his sources of income or the total amount of money for any given year, nor his entire compensation package. Why? It would disgrace him. When you go into the ministry, you go into the nonprofit sector, not the for profit sector. You have no aspirations of being wealthy. If you do, stay out. Okay. He says here that an interest free loan of $50,000 to, uh, to MacArthur's right hand man is illegal. What is private inurement? Just briefly. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, it should go without saying that money and other assets uh, a nonprofit obtains are to be used only for the organization's nonprofit purposes, not for the private gain or enrichment of those who run the nonprofit, unless it's specifically for compensation, right? Um, not for the enrichment of those who run the nonprofit, founded it, work for it, contribute to it, or are related to it in any other way. We'll refer to these individuals as insiders. The tax law provides that an organization is entitled to tax exempt status only if it's organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, scientific, um, and a few other specified purposes. Obviously, this requirement is not satisfied where a nonprofit's money is used to benefit insiders instead of furthering its exempt purposes. So, if that's what happened, and Brent is correct, that uh, this $50,000 loan was given interest-free and fully forgiven for the benefit of Phil Johnson, a law may have been broken. I suspect people are looking into this uh, as we speak. I'll certainly play my part in uh, helping to ensure that um, that this is looked into. Um, as some of Phil Johnson's uh, own friends have said, you know, when you, the Christian thing to do, when you find out that there's something illegal going on, if you suspect there's something illegal, the, the Christian thing to do is to uh, apprise the authorities of that. So is this a uh, private inurement? Well, we'll find out. But this may not be, may not be, I don't know, may not be the only law Phil Johnson broke. Remember, this is an elder at Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's close personal friend, right-hand man, and I believe the primary editor of his books. This is the fruit of John MacArthur's ministry, for those who weren't convinced already. This is a breakdown of his salaries, uh, as, she, as she noted, from 2005 to 2015, for an average of about uh, $320,000 a year. That is just from Grace to You and the Master's University and Seminary. They don't disclose what the church pays him or his royalties, uh, honorarium, other things, bonuses, and so forth. We don't know what those things are. Uh, but they did admit that they do pay him some kind of salary. So he gets a church salary, a Grace to You salary, and a uh, master's university and seminary salary, not to mention housing allowances, uh, health care, and, and so on and so forth, which is why Brent uh, DeWittler, uh, Detweiler, sorry, Detweiler, estimates between one and a half and two million dollars is his fuller compensation package, his actual uh, in income. Very interesting. Leave it to leave it to a heretic like Rick Warren to outshine John MacArthur in financial matters. Rick Warren doesn't take a salary from Saddleback Church. It doesn't make him less of a heretic. It doesn't make him less covetous. But it does make him more uh, self-aware. It does make him more aware of the optics at the very least. So he doesn't take a salary. He lives exclusively off of his book royalties. 
And according to Rick Warren, who has a funny habit of letting his right hand uh, know what his left hand's doing and then letting the world know what both of them are doing, he says that he is a reverse tither and gives away 90% of his income. I don't have any verification of that. Um, But it's possible it's true. I don't know. And I'm sure he would live quite comfortably on 10% of that income anyway. Uh, But in any event, um, it it, it is provable whether or not Saddleback Church uh, pays Rick Warren a salary. John MacArthur has three salaries coming in. Isn't that a shame? Here's where it starts getting interesting. Pay attention. A family affair. The nepotism, you need to understand, in the mega church world is, uh, it's almost unheard of that there isn't nepotism. Let's put it that way. I've seen this personally, and anybody who has been a part of a mega church for any length of time has, in all probability, seen this as well. The pastor's children are employed by the church, and they're usually in a prominent position. They're usually waiting to take over the reins. This happened with James McDonald. It happens at Greg Laurie's church. His children are employed. James McDonald's kids were employed by him. Um, It happens at uh, Grace Community Church, not only with John MacArthur's sons, but with uh, friends of his. Uh, I believe Austin Duncan is an elder there, and his father is Legan Duncan, a longtime friend of John MacArthur. It's a family affair, and it's a... if if you're friends, you're going to be uh, promoted and and in, into some high position. Um, I've seen it in the Calvary Chapel world. It happens all the time. It's very rare that it doesn't happen. These are family empires. They are businesses, and they look out for their own. How do we benefit the family? Um. On its website, the ECFA, um, I forget what the acronym is, Evangelical Something for Financial Accountability. Um, it's probably in here somewhere. Uh, when when a, They say, when a ministry encounters failure or even worse, scandal, its difficulties can almost always be traced to a breakdown in governance. Okay. Let's get down here. A key characteristic of good governance, according to the ECFA, is maintaining the reality, not just the appearance, of independent board governance. All right, the ECFA considers board members to be independent if they are not related by blood or employees of the organization. Um, For decades, though, two of MacArthur's sons have served on Grace to Use board along with their father. Oh, shocked? You shouldn't be. Phil Johnson, a key Grace to You employee, has also served on the board for many years. Since 2002, the Grace to You board has ranged in size from 8 to 12 members. So at times, as many as half of the board was either a MacArthur or an employee under John MacArthur. One of MacArthur's sons, Matthew MacArthur, remains on the board and has been listed on every 990 since 2002, as the treasurer of grace to you. John MacArthur's own son is the treasurer of grace to you. And he got a first edition King James Bible, John MacArthur did. And he has three homes, one with a tennis court and one apparently with a lake. But Justin Peters has an issue with Jesse Duplantis's parsonage. I wonder if he has anything to say about this ridiculous, ridiculous financial fiasco we're looking at. I'm willing to bet you won't hear a word. In February 2020, Mark MacArthur, his other son, was charged by the Securities and Exchange Commission with defrauding clients in a $16 million investment scheme. Shocking. As late as August 2020, Mark MacArthur was still listed on Grace to Use website as a board member. Mark MacArthur is not listed as a board member today. Hmm. Not today, but a few months ago he was. In his 2014 statement, Johnson stated that board members with blood relationship or employment connections to John MacArthur recuse themselves from salary decisions. 
However, it's not just John MacArthur who's potentially benefiting from his sons and Johnson's presence on the board. Grace to You has also paid MacArthur's son-in-law, Corey Welch, many of you might are probably familiar with this story, and companies Welch owns millions over the years, as has the Master's University and Seminary. In 2008, Welch was an employee of Grace to You, making $83,677 as Director of Television and Broadcasting. Welch, who's married to MacArthur's daughter, Melinda Welch, formerly Melinda MacArthur, also was enjoying a $20,000 no-interest home loan with total debt forgiveness from Grace to You. At least they consistently hand out money to their friends or family members. In 2008, there were no other contracts uh, providing video production services for Grace to You, according to the organization's 990s. The next year, however, Welch began working for Grace to You as a private video production contractor through a company Welch had formed two years earlier called the Welch Group. In 2009, Grace to You paid the Welch Group, listen to this, $741,000 for, quote, post-production services, and, quote, nearly 10 times what Grace to You had paid Welch the year before. Interesting. A thousand percent raise? Boy, that's impressive. Since then, Grace to You has paid either the Welch Group or Dorma Productions, another small company Welch owns, between six hundred and fifty nine thousand and seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars per year for a combined eight point three million dollars between two thousand nine and two thousand nineteen. Another company owned by Welch called We Creative has also received more than $1 million in contract work from the Master's University and Seminary. From 2016 through 2019, the Master's University paid We Creative nearly $1.1 million for, quote, marketing, public relations, and video production services, end quote, according to the Master's University and Seminary audit reports and 990s. During this time, 2018 and 2019, the Masters University also employed Welch as its COO and for a time as its chief marketing officer, for which Welch received more than $138,000 in salary and benefits. The Masters University and Seminary did not respond to requests for a comment about Welch's contract work, I'm sure they didn't, or the potential conflict of interest concerning his position at the Masters University and Seminary. In addition to these jobs and positions, Welch is the CEO of the John MacArthur Charitable Trust, formerly the Masters Grace Fund. This is a California nonprofit created to support various ministries of John MacArthur, according to Grace to Use 2019 financial statement. The sole member of the John MacArthur Charitable Trust is Grace to You. And Grace to You elects a majority of the trust board. The trust does not file 990s, so it's not known if it pays Welch a salary for his services. But given this track record, it stands to reason they do. Money and ministry. You show me a person who preaches the money gospel, the money message, and the wealth message, and I'll show you a person who's been corrupted by the love of money, so said John MacArthur in a 1987 sermon. MacArthur added that he never, ever wanted to be in a position to look at ministry with a price tag. That's why, MacArthur said, he never asks for money when he preaches at other churches. That's just too overwhelming a problem for my flesh to deal with. Yet clearly, MacArthur takes plenty of money from his own ministries. And though MacArthur may have never preached the prosperity gospel, a gospel that promises health and wealth, his income and portfolio looks an awful lot like those who do. In fact, it looks better than a lot of those who do. Different product, same motive. MacArthur may be America's anti-prosperity gospel preacher, but his life and the life of his family members appears to be quite prosperous, and he seemingly has his ministries to thank. Yes. Yes, indeed he does. A very damning report, to say the least. And far from addressing what was written in it, what 
at least Phil Johnson, who is uh, implicated as one of their uh, corrupt members, responded by by doxing Julie. Those unfamiliar with the term, uh, he put her personal information out there, namely her home address and perhaps more. So she wrote another article just a few days ago, which th- there's so many layers to this corruption to these people. And again, Phil Johnson has no problem lying about whatever. He's got a bunch of corrupt friends too. The the well runs deep. We just don't have time to get into all this. We will eventually. But um, Phil Johnson, in an attempt to uh, show the letter that she referenced here, uh, or or to show a letter that he wrote to her, sorry, in March of 2020, when she asked for some information, uh, he said, well, none of us in this ministry will ever speak to you again. This is my last correspondence. Uh, he decided to post a copy of that letter that just included her home address. So, Julie Royce writes, Phil Johnson, the director of John MacArthur's broadcast ministry, Grace to You, doxed me yesterday in a document posted online. The coward. When confronted, Johnson defended what he did. Of course he did. Of course he did. He's a godless man whose god is his belly in more than one way. To dox someone is to publish private Uh, or identifying information about that person, especially as a form of punishment or revenge. Doxing is illegal and punishable up to one year in jail or a fine of $1,000. This is what's coming out of John MacArthur's church. And feel free to look in the comments. You're going to see people defend John MacArthur shamelessly. And defend Phil Johnson, just like Phil Johnson defended his own actions. So the potential illegal case, potentially, of private inurement, and now the potential illegal case of doxing. Well, it is true that uh, that Phil Johnson did post um, identifying information about her, private information about her, and it's true that that's illegal. And then he defends what he did. John MacArthur says nothing. Justin Peters says nothing. Todd Friel, his staunchest defenders, say nothing. Why? None of them will bite the hand that feeds them. They are hypocrites and frauds the whole lot. Listen, you've got two gangs in California, right? Two prominent gangs for years, the Bloods and the Crips. They don't like each other. They hate each other. They kill each other all the time. It doesn't mean that one is less corrupt than the other, or one is more corrupt. They're both corrupt. So the fact that John MacArthur has issues with certain other people doesn't mean that he is pure before God. You're seeing a greedy, fraudulent business that is as corrupt as Washington politics. In my case, she says, Johnson published my home address. This was in response to an article I posted this week about the salaries, secrecy, and lifestyle of Johnson's boss, John MacArthur, which we just read. My article also noted that Grace to You paid Johnson $230,000 plus salary and a sizable loan, which was fully forgiven. I'm sure Phil Johnson didn't like that, so he resorted to underhanded tactics. Johnson included my address in a letter he posted online and then linked it to a tweet. After I confronted Johnson publicly for what he had done, he blurred the address in the online letter, which still contains my city and zip code. Johnson did not comment about what he had done, but instead defended publishing my address in a tweet. And you can read through all this. The the tweet below shows both the original letter he posted, which has been modified to obscure my address, beside the letter with the blurred address. So she still blurred it out, but here's the original one he posted with her address clear as day on the top. But here's where it gets interesting and apparently sinister. Okay, so you can go read through all of Phil Johnson's tweets. Um... 
Johnson complained that she cherry-picked quotes in her story and didn't link to the full versions of certain documents. Uh, he went on to—he's done the same thing with me. He, oh, he's called me a spiritual Ishmael and oh, a, a theological pugilist. And anytime somebody critiques Phil Johnson, they're, 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 they're just automatically a devil, right? Because Phil Johnson's never wrong, says the man who potentially committed a crime here. That's what we're trying to figure out. It certainly looks that way, doesn't it, Mr. Johnson? Yet Johnson later admitted in a tweet that he never mailed the letter with my address that he posted online. He sent me an email instead. So this was a, a apparently a typed letter, but he didn't mail it to her. He sent it to her by email, okay? Plus, while the online uh, letter is dated March of 2020... The document's embedded metadata shows that the letter was created on February 3rd, 2021. That's the same day I published the article on John MacArthur. Okay, so she shows all of this here. When asked on Twitter about the creation of the letter, Johnson claimed he created a, a hard copy of the letter in March for his files. He then says he scanned the letter to a PDF more recently. However... The original PDF of the letter, which is no longer available online, but I have in my possession, she says, is editable, and the font appears to be real and not a picture. Right? He didn't just scan a picture. It's, it's an editable link. Also, a link to the Grace to You website at the bottom of the letter is active. There's an active link in it. Um, you can't have active links in pictures that you scan. Which would not be the case if it was a scanned document, she says. This link was also active in the revised letter with my address blurred at the time of publishing. Additionally, listen, in the letter posted online, the name Grace to you C, uh, of Grace to You CFO David Fisk is removed and appears as D blank F blank. Yet there would have been no reason to redact the name in a letter sent to me in March. The email Johnson sent me in March included Fisk's name. Other than Fisk's name, the letterhead and signature, the only difference between the email and the letter Johnson posted is the addition of my address. If you didn't decipher what we just went through, it appears that Phil Johnson deliberately added her address after the fact but attempted to make it look like it had been there since March so he'd have some convenient excuse for accidentally doxing Julie Roy's. That's what it looks like. That's almost certainly what happened here. We're trying to get to the bottom of all this, aren't we? Phil, did you do that? Because if you sent her an email of that letter in March, first of all, there wouldn't have been no need for her address on it. How did you redact David Fisk's name, but you couldn't redact her address? You had the foresight to redact his name, but you didn't have the foresight to redact her address? Sounds intentional. Sounds deliberate. It sounds illegal. That's what it sounds like. That's what it looks like. This is the fruit of John MacArthur and his cohorts, his henchmen. I tweeted to Johnson about the issue, issues with his story about the letter's creation, but he did not respond. Of course he didn't respond. He's a coward. He's a swindler. There are similar issues with the second document Johnston, Johnson posted, which was also linked to his tweet about the letter. In his tweet, Johnson suggests that the document was available to me before I published. However, like the letter Johnson posted, the metadata for the second document shows it was created on February 3rd as well. And she's got all this information here. She reached out on uh, Twitter to exp for him to explain the discrepancy in the dates concerning the second document, but at the time of this, as of the time of this publishing, he did not respond. The original email Johnson sent in March March 23rd, 2020, was a response to my request for information about MacArthur's salary. The Grace to You board, Grace to You contacts, contract sorry, with MacArthur's family members. He, Johnson's email was sent to me soon after 
I reported that a person who had attended 2020 Shepherds Conference at the Grace Community Church had contracted COVID-19 and died. I think she said in the previous article that it was 10 months later. So he never responded to her request until she started writing about them again. Uh, Suddenly he was inspired to oblige her request. In the email, Johnson accuses me of making false accusations and scandal-mongering and likens my website to the nest of nests of busybodies and says I'm bent on destroying another's reputation. Hmm, interesting. Johnson closes by saying he will never correspond with me again, nor will anybody from Grace to You, and that was indeed in the previous uh, document. Um... She says, tweets fail to answer questions. Johnson's series of five tweets that he posted Friday are only res- the only responses from Grace to You, Grace Community Church, or the Master's University and Seminary to the serious governance and financial issues I raised in my article on MacArthur. The tweets fail to answer why MacArthur appears to make three full-time salaries from his ministries when he seemingly works part-time for at least two of them. They also give no explanation for MacArthur's expensive lifestyle, which includes three luxury homes, nor do the tweets address why MacArthur's sons and Johnson, a key employee, served on the Grace to You board for decades. Um, He does explain why they withdrew from the ECFA, which would have forced them to disclose uh, financial information uh, about the church. The Grace Community Church withdrew from that organization, so they didn't have to tell you how much they paid John MacArthur. Isn't that convenient? Um, so all of his tweets are here for, for you to go through. Um, and yeah. Oh, here she goes. Um, and this is a common tactic of the MacArthur camp. Other tweets of Johnson's were mainly ad hominem arguments, calling my work scandal mongering, twaddle and shoddy and alleging I'm not a legitimate journalist and likening me to relentless busy bodies and gossip mongers. Below is Johnson's initial thread of five tweets. Yeah. Well, it's not surprising that Phil Johnson has friends like Jordan Hall and Chris Rosebro. Uh, they're, they're all the, the same, uh, of the same mind. And it's a devious mind. It's a sinister mind. It's a corrupt mind. And they engage in corrupt activities, apparently. Look what we're looking at here. This is incredible. But they'll march on as if nothing's happening. Justin Peters will march on as if nothing's happening. He won't bite the hand that feeds him. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals or good habits. And if you already have bad habits and bad morals, it'll make bad ones worse, which is why there's this network. There's this network of people, right? You've probably heard the the phrase, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are, right? It it shouldn't surprise anybody that that Phil Johnson is a conference partner of, uh, of a Chris Rosebro of Fighting for the Faith. Hey Chris, would you care to talk about your friend Phil's actions here? I bet you I bet you wouldn't. I bet you wouldn't. See, this is what real journalism looks like. This is what real evidence looks like. This isn't speculation. This isn't gossip. This isn't conjecture and hearsay. What they engage in is actual scandal mongering, these men. And it's an act of projection. They must project their activities onto others. So while Phil Johnson calls Julie Roy's a scandal mongerer, his entire network is filled with scandal mongerers. Potentially, Phil Johnson's involved in a private inurement uh, debacle. Potentially, Phil Johnson broke the law by doxing Julie Roy's. It appears that way. If he had the foresight to take uh, and redact David Fisk's name, but put her private information up there, that's not looking good. And then he defended it on top of that, knowing that he shouldn't do that. Yeah. Phil Johnson is a reprobate. John MacArthur is a millionaire. These are greedy men. Greedy, lavish, millionaire men whose gods are their bellies. 
just because he has said some true things, and he has, um, you will know them by their fruits. This is the fruit of John MacArthur and his empire. $8.3 million paid to his daughter and her husband over a course of 10 years for for videography work that, uh, according to some people, is not all that impressive. Well, I'm not saying it's bad. I haven't evaluated the, the technical aspects of their uh, videography. But uh, 700 plus thousand dollars a year to, to make some videos for grace to you? Boy, I bet you could have assembled a team of several people and paid them significantly less. I bet you could have assembled a team of people for half that and got better quality. But John MacArthur's daughter, Melinda, stood to benefit. You see the nepotism, you see the cronyism, you see the kickbacks, you see the lobbying and so forth. This is no different than politics in Washington. Republican, Democrat, corrupt, corrupt, generally speaking. They might vehemently oppose each other, and yet they live the same lifestyles at the end of the day. They seem to hate each other's ideology, but they're both motivated by some kind of greed. And it's pretty evident, like Justin Peters said, we can't ignore the obvious motive here. There's just a lot of money in this business. And it's a tried and proven business. Oh, granted, MacArthur sells a different product than the Kenneth Copelands and the Benny Hins. But he's selling products. John MacArthur is absolutely doing business in Jesus' name to the tune of three homes. One of them's got a tennis court. There is much more to discuss. I will commend you to uh, Julie Roy's uh, keep an eye out for updates on this situation, uh, and especially Phil Johnson and what he did to her. Um, this sort of behavior uh, cannot be excused. When you uh, see Justin Peters fail to say anything about this, it will be further proof of his own fraudulence and hypocrisy. When you see Todd Friel fail to say anything about this, it will be further proof of, proof of his and Wretched Radio's fraudulence and hypocrisy. They will not bite the hand that feeds them. They will do what MacArthur did uh, in the middle of the social justice fiasco. When he said, I'm not going to fight my friends. Oh, I'll fight social justice, but I'm not going to fight my friends, even if they're the ones promoting this garbage. Um, he said that if, if I did that, why would I do that? I would just be on an island then. Yet these are the same men that like to quote Charles Spurgeon, uh, who withdrew from the Baptist Union uh, amid the downgrade and lost many friends. These guys aren't willing to do that because their friend is themselves. It's not truth. It's not Jesus. Oh, they'll say his name. Just like Paul said, there's many that preach Christ. They do it from a place of envy, from strife, from selfish ambition. Judas went along with the true disciples. He said true things. There's no record of false teaching coming from Judas. And yet he was a greedy thief the whole time who betrayed Jesus. It was eventually flushed out. They didn't see it for a long time. But when it was flushed out, there was an obligation to address it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 mentions covetous men whom you're not even to eat with. Stop sending Grace Community Church your money. Stop sending uh, Grace to you your money. Stop sending John MacArthur your money. If you don't, heck, he might have a fourth home in the works. How many homes does John MacArthur need? Watch how they'll try to defend it. Ah, but, but the, the cost of living in California is so much more than it's... No, it's not. His homes are worth, like, like she pointed out, this one home is worth twice the median value, first of all. Second of all, why does he need three of them? Don't talk to me about the cost of living in California is so high that therefore he needs two homes in California and one in Colorado and a first edition King James Bible worth who knows how much. Hundreds of thousands, I'm sure. The, the cost of living so high, that's why he needs to make more than the President of the United States. Senators. 
senators who live in California don't make as much as John MacArthur makes. And in fact, they're probably not as much as Phil Johnson makes. It's, it's right around the same area. He's not preaching that you'll get rich, but he's banking on the fact that you're going to make him rich, which is why apparently he's authored some 200 books. Most health and wealth teachers haven't authored as many books as John MacArthur. How many has he actually written? I, I don't know. A lot of times they publish books with the person's name on it. They'll license their name out sometimes. I can't say that John MacArthur has done that. I can only say that it has been done. This is what you're looking at. You're looking at corruption. You're looking at nepotism. You're looking at the lavish lifestyle of a millionaire who criticizes other millionaires. He just doesn't like the way they got rich, and, and so, so a lot of his sycophants will, will do. Yeah, but just because he made a lot of money doesn't mean, again, leave it to heretic Rick Warren to shame John MacArthur in financial matters, who doesn't take a salary from Saddleback Church but lives exclusively on book royalties. You don't think MacArthur's royalties are enough to sustain him comfortably? Surely they are. Or maybe his property taxes are so high with three homes that he now he needs all this income. I, I don't know. But you're looking at a man who has a, a net worth larger than probably half the Hillsong pastors. He didn't do it deceiving people, though. Business is business. He's making merchandise out of God. Those who sold and bought in the temple, John chapter 2, they, they were selling things for a purpose. They weren't deceiving people. They were doing business in God's name. Jesus flipped over their tables, didn't he? They'd made it a house of merchandise, and boy, is MacArthur living lavishly. What will his defenders say now? It's going to be sad to hear the ridiculous defenses for this. And I suspect it's only going to get worse. Let's see what the IRS has to say about this. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.